We're back in our answer series again today. And the question is this, what can I share with someone who thinks they are too bad to be saved? Now, the actual question that came to me is, what verses can one share with someone who says they've been so bad, now listen to this, that God would not save them and let them into heaven? Well, it's very important when someone says a statement like that, that we listen very carefully to what the person has said. We have to listen. What has he said? What has he admitted? What does he already know? And the reason I say this is sometimes we, as the person hearing the statement, we get tripped up on what we think is a magic formula to lead a person to the Lord. And we've all, all learned that. In fact, I'll share it with you. Uh, whatever track that you use, whatever, be it the Roman road or, or uh, uh, steps to peace with God or whatever it is, there are basically three parts of Jesus becoming a Savior, three little sections in every one of those uh, tracks. The first part is, we think we have to convince the person, I'll put it that way, that they must acknowledge their, that they are a sinner. So they have to acknowledge you're a sinner. Part two is, they have to acknowledge that Jesus is the Savior. And part three is, they invite Jesus to be their Savior. So there's three parts in every evangelistic track or, or uh, presentation of the gospel. However, remember, I'm telling you, we have to listen carefully to what a person has said to really know where we want to pick up in that process of leading someone to the Lord. Now, here's what I'm saying to you. When a person says and, and, uh, something like this, I have been such a reprobate that God will not save me and let me into heaven. Now, I've heard that. I've also heard in that same time where they call themselves a reprobate, and you kind of question about that. What, what do you mean by reprobate? They said, they'll say, I've just been so bad in my life that God will not save me and let me into heaven. Okay, so they've used the word reprobate, and they've also used the word, I'm so bad. And, and I want to show you some things because it's very important because when we're trying to lead someone to accept Jesus as their savior what I'm telling you today is is we don't have to default to go back through all the steps uh, to um, lead someone to the Lord if they've already jumped those steps on for themselves and here's what I mean by this okay Remember the three parts of Jesus becoming your Savior. The first part is acknowledging that you are a sinner. Okay, let's look back at this statement. I have been so bad, or I have been such a reprobate. Okay, look at that and realize they have already checked the box for that first part because that person knows that he's a sinner. How does he know that he's a sinner? He knows that he's been so bad and he's been a reprobate, which means he knows what he has done are sins. So he's already recognizing and acknowledging that he is a sinner. So we don't know, need to go back through all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God or anything like that. We don't need to go through the Roman road for this part because He's already acknowledging that he is a sinner. Now, let's hear part two. He says, I am so bad or I've, such a, I've been such a reprobate that God will not save me. Okay, look at that. What is he saying here? Part two is acknowledge that Jesus is the Savior or that God can save him. And he has checked that box too because he knows and he believes in a God. We don't have to convince him of a God because he's already there. I am so bad means I'm a sinner and I know that God will not save me because of how bad I am. So he acknowledges his sin and he acknowledges God. Now part three is next. 
Part three is where he must invite Jesus to be his Savior. Okay, that box is not checked because he says, I am so bad that I know God will not save me and let me into his heaven. In other words, he knows he's a sinner. He knows that there is a God and he believes that there is a God, but God won't let him into his heaven. So he has not invited Jesus to be his Savior. And this is where I'm saying we have to listen because we do not need to open our track of the Roman road and go through the whole thing because two parts of what this person, maybe even on their dying bed, has said, has said, we don't need to traipse over that, that ground again. We don't need to go over that real estate again of leading some of the Lord because they're already two parts into it and they're acknowledging two parts of it that they ha have already uh, uh, transpired and checked the boxes off. And what I'm showing you is checking boxes off. Okay, so there's no magical words, if you remember, to jump through to accept Jesus. Remember, last week we dealt with the thieves on the cross and how the thief on the right just said to the thief on the left, we are sinners, we've done things wrong, we deserve to die, acknowledging that he's a sinner. But he, he does not believe there, I need to be here, doesn't deserve to be here. And then that person on the right says, Jesus, will you remember me? And in other words, he's acknowledging that Jesus is the Savior. And the Jesus turns to him and says, today you will be with me in paradise. So he acknowledges Jesus the Savior. And really, he says, when he says, remember me, he's checking box number three. Oh, well, that's not what's happening with the person who we're talking to in this. Now, listen, in my 50 years, almost 50 years of ministry, I will um, hit my 50 year anniversary in ministry on January the 20th of 2024, 50 years since I was officially voted in by a church to become, uh, to go on a staff as a staff member for the very first time uh, of a church in Longview, a wonderful little church in Longview. And they, they brought me on staff. I was still in high school. So that'll be my 50th anniversary. In my 50 years um, of ministry, and they're talking with thousands and thousands and thousands of people because I've been in some really good churches. And the Lord has really blessed me. And then, of course, the church that I was in for 30 years uh, only had 5,000 members whenever I uh, started on staff there 30 years. Uh, well, I was on there for right at 30. I was at the, that church for right at 30 years. Uh, the church ended up with over 21,000 by the time I left the church. So we're talking thousands and thousands of people that I have interacted with, have been in my classes and all of that. And in all this time for 50 years, I have only had five people who have said to me, I'm just too bad for God to allow me to get into heaven. I have been such a reprobate that God will not allow me to be into heaven. He will not save me. So... I'm, I want to tell you about what I know about the characteristics of these five individuals. Now, these five individuals um, may not be representative or, or represent the those same words coming out of everybody's mouth in their personalities and the way they think. In fact, the personalities were different. Some were very meek. Some were very mild. Some were very um, uh, strong-willed, uh, as I think back about them. But there's some characteristics about them. Number one characteristic to, that I have I found and I know about those five individuals who, who have said those same words to me in some form or fashion. They were all raised in a church where from the pulpit, condemnation was a major theme, a major theme. Uh, so four of these people were males and one was a female. And uh, uh, two happened to come out of a Catholic background. Two came out of a reform background and one came out of an independent Baptist background, which is an extremely strict and, and um, 
uh, how I say, uh, condemning uh, Baptist theology, which is not the theology that I have, not the theology of this, the church I was in for 30 years or the church that I'm teaching at now. Uh, the, the, we, we don't condemn folks, okay, especially for their sin. We help them get past it. But independent Baptists, they are very um, condemning, and so are Reformed, because if you disagree with them, they come at you uh, condemning everything about you to try to shame you uh, into uh, because of your sin. And then, of course, the Catholics have their checklist where, you know, they want to keep you coming through the door and keep you thinking you have to do things to be saved, so you have to go to the priest and you have to confess and all these type of things. Well, I've heard this statement only five times in my almost 50 years of ministry, and it may not represent the people in the world who have said these things uh, to other people, but these are characteristics about what people that these five that I know that have actually said this to me, and I've had to minister to them to lead them to the Lord that these are the characteristics they have. And all five came out of a uh, denomination that was very condemning. A and they, they, they knew they were sinners. They knew and accepted about God, but they were not willing to even ask Jesus to come into their life and be their Savior and be their Lord because of the condemnation of which they were living under because of things that people and pastors and ministers had said to them and really bruised their fruit to not realize that Jesus loves everyone and he doesn't want any of them to perish. And, and, and he died on the cross for every one of them. And so the first characteristic is they were raised in a church where condemnation was the major theme. Now, the next thing that happens is, next characteristics, is all five that I know of, as soon as they were of the age where they could leave home or get away from that church, they left the church as soon as they could. In other words, they bolted. That's what they did. They just bolted out of the church. When they went to college or they moved to another town or took a job or whatever and got away from the family that was always in church, they stopped going to church early on. And they were out of the church for really many years. Oh, they may still have done the Catholic thing of here and there and what they have to do or the Reformed thing, but they were really out of church. The Independent Baptist, of course, was totally out of church during that time. The next thing is, the third characteristic is, they all knew they were sinners. Just like I told you a while ago, they all admitted that they were sinners. And they had admitted they were sinners for a long, long time. And they were dealing with their sins. And every time they sinned, you know, they knew they were sinning because of the, some of the teaching they had had, but also some of it was because this Holy Spirit was urging them, you know, you're a sinner. You are a sinner. The next characteristic is they were all older when they started expressing this concern. I've lived a reprobate life. I, I, I've, I've done so many bad things. I did them over and over and over and over again. I was practicing that sin and I was happy with that sin until I'd committed the sin and then I realized I shouldn't have done it because it's against the morals and the, and the, and the things that that I know God doesn't like. How do they know that? Because they know enough about God to know what he's told us is a sin and is not a sin. And in fact, another characteristic of this, because they're older, these were all older people, they used the word reprobate at some time in the conversation. Now, folks, if you're dealing with somebody younger uh, than we are, in those of us in our 60s, really anybody born after 1974 or whatever, the word reprobate is not in the vocabulary. But everybody born before 74, uh, 60s and whatever, that word reprobate is there because it was used in almost every pulpit. I don't ever hear it said from the word pul from the pulpit any longer. But any of those sermons and everything of any of the preachers of the churches all the way back before 1974 and on back, 
the word reprobate was in the conversation. So for the older people that I've dealt with, they use the word repro uh, reprobate. For the younger ones, probably now if I meet another one uh, that's younger, as they're getting older and, and their bodies are growing frail and they're now concerned about uh, uh, their salvation because they're coming to where they're thinking, okay, I've lived a lot of life. And as I've lived a lot of life, I probably don't have much life left to me. Oh, I got a cancer, uh, I got a cancer uh, a verdict, uh, a diagnosis, or uh, um, uh, uh, my heart, I've got a heart attack. Uh, issue. I've had a heart attack. Now they start thinking about their past and how sinful they've been. And, and the newer folks are probably going to use the word, I did such, I've done such bad things that God won't allow me into his heaven. God won't allow me there. So they use the word reprobate or they're going to use the word so bad. Another characteristic of them, of all five was, all could not trust the Lord to save them. I mean, they knew they were sinners. They knew that they that there's a God, but they just could not trust that if they accepted the uh, asked the Lord to be their Savior, that the Lord would truly save them. They just didn't have the trust in the Lord for that. Another characteristics is that they they did not understand, or they all do not understand the mercy of the Lord, of what He did for us on the cross, where He paid for our sins and He took them upon Himself so that He could give forgiveness and forgive anyone who sinned. They just do not understand that mercy of the Lord. And so the question comes up, is anyone too bad to be saved? Is anyone too bad to be saved? Well, if you ask Paul, Paul would say, no, no one is too bad to be saved. You remember what Paul said in, to, in, uh, to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. He says, he says, Timothy, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful putting me into service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying, yes, I remember I have not forgotten my past sins against the Lord. I blasphemed the Lord. I persecuted the Lord. I was a violent aggressor. In fact, last week's lesson, we dealt with why can we not forget our sins here on earth, sins that have already been forgiven and wiped clean in heaven and are not going to be there against us when we get there. The old account is settled, settled long ago when we ask the Lord to forgive us. But here on earth, we seem to keep dragging up these sins. And the reason is therefore our protection so that we will not repeat those sins again and again and again. Because if you forget what you did, you'll repeat it. And I showed you all those verses in the Old Testament to show where the Lord kept saying, don't forget what you did to cause my wrath to come upon you. Oh, over and over and over and over again in last week's lesson, the Lord says, you're not going to forget. I'm not going to let you forget your sins because if I let you forget your sins and help you forget your sins, you're going to repeat those same sins over again. And the Lord carries all that out. But, but Paul is saying here, the Lord put me on a new path. I still remember what I did to him, but he put me on a new path. Okay. The thing we have to understand is, is we have to t let this person know who has done such bad things, as bad as what Paul did, that he need, they need to get on a new path with the Lord. So with that as the background, I want to answer the question. The question is, what can I share with someone who thinks they are too bad to be saved because God won't save them? Too bad to be saved. So let's bring this back up. Uh, like Paul in the Bible, a person says, you're too bad. I'm too bad to be saved. The thing you could say to that person is, look, you have already admitted that you're a sinner. You've already jumped through that. 
There's no sense in us covering or asking you about your sins. I don't want to know what your sins are, but you've evidently got a pile of sins just like I have a pile of sins. I mean, I've got a big pile of sins in my life that come back to mind, or little things that might, uh, that might cause me to remember. There's one interesting thing. Uh, uh, our, my sins always seem to be tied to something that causes me to remember them. And I remember, oh, <laughs> before I went into the ministry, while I was still in high school, there's something that I did that after I did it, and I was already saved, and the Lord, con the Holy Spirit convicted me that it was a sin, I remember popping, a, uh, opening a can of Bark's root beer, Bark's root beer, and drinking it. Okay. It just so happens that any time I drink a root beer, guess what happens to me? I remember that sin. And so we can't run away. And, and in fact, most almost every one of us in, in our sins, we will get into situations where we'll say, oh, we have been here before. Oh, this is not good. Oh, I remember what I did. Listen, you can say, listen, you've already admitted that you are a sinner. So you're on your way. Next thing is, is you've already admitted that God is the one who can save you. But you know that. You already know that. In fact, then you can say this. The Bible says, and you know this scripture probably too, and they all did. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Why? So that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. It's the first scripture, or really the first scripture you need to say to them. You don't need to tell them the, the, the first Timothy passage. That was just to prove that Saul had the same problem with his old sin and he was moving on, but he kept remembering his old sin. This is the scripture that you need to know. Listen, you've already admitted you're a sinner. You also know that God, God um, is the one who can save. And then you say, do you remember the verse, John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And then you say to that person, God does not want anyone to perish because of sin. Jesus died so you would not perish in your sin. You say that to them. God does not want anyone to perish because of sin. And Jesus died so you would not perish in your sin. And since you have already admitted that you're a sinner, God hears that and he knows it. You've admitted it. You've confessed it. You've, you've acknowledged. You've really confessed it. I mean, you've poured it out. I've been too bad. God hears it. And since you have already admitted that God is the one who saves because you've been so bad that God surely wouldn't save you or let him into heaven. You've just admitted two things. Two things. You know, Paul said in Romans 10.9, this is the second scripture you need. Paul said in Romans 10.9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, 9. And then you just say, listen, you already know that God raised Jesus from the dead so people can be saved. You already know that. And because I care for you and I care for your eternity, I want to ask you to take the last step. I want to openly just say to you, because you're my friend and I know you, I want you to take the last step because I'm going to heaven because the Lord is my Savior. I want you to have the Lord as your Savior, Savior too. And I want you to please pray right now and ask Jesus to save you and be your Lord. Can I pray first with you? And then you pray and ask Jesus to be your Savior. And don't wait for an answer. Don't let them shake their head up and down. Here's what you do. You say, Dear Lord, 
My friend knows that he is a sinner and he knows that you can save him so he can spend all eternity with you. Please hear him as he prays to ask you to be the Lord of his life. Okay, my friend, pray and ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. All five times when this has happened with me, that's what I have said. I've showed them that they are two-thirds of the way there. And when I have prayed and say, listen to Him, O Lord, and accept Him as He prays to you, those people on their own know exactly what to say. And in all five cases, they said, well, let me take that back. In four cases, they said, Lord Jesus, I want to ask you to be my Lord and Savior. And I said, Amen. And I said, look up at me. You've just asked Him. The Holy Spirit has come into you. You are now saved. When you die and you leave this world with whatever ails you, you are headed off to heaven. You are not headed to hell because your sins have been forgiven. You've acknowledged them. You've acknowledged that God is the Savior and you've asked Jesus can save you and you've asked Jesus to be your Lord. He is your Lord right now. You can just take that to the bank and never doubt it. It happened on this day at this time and you remember that. Just like you have remembered your sins, you remember when the Lord has come into your life because you invited Him in, him in to your life. Now, remember I said on four. On one of them <laughs> who said the thing to me, same characteristics, came out of a church that, was, that had a condemnation message, got away from church as quickly as possible, got into his 80s before he started saying, I've been such a reprobate, I've been so bad, God can't save me. And uh, this very interesting was because I remember all the family was sitting there and we were all saying, we want you to be in heaven with us when we go there. All of us are going there. We've all asked Jesus, and we want you to accept him. Why can you not accept him? And the words came out of his mouth, I just cannot accept that a resurrected man really rose from the dead. And I said to that person, I said, hold on, hold, hold on, wait a minute. Okay. I am the theologian in this room and I'm willing to take the responsibility for what I am about to say to you. If you doubt that a resurrected man, that Jesus was actually resurrected, let's set that aside for a moment. If you have looked off into the stars and you've looked at all of nature and you will worship the God who created that and who was the creator, and that happens to be the Lord, the Lord who died to be your Savior. And he didn't say anything. He just thought. And the family got me aside and said, listen, don't you know that you have to believe in the resurrection? I said, listen, I am willing. I know that's the story Paul says later on in the book of Romans. But I'm willing to go back because you have to remember there were people all over the world who believed in the Creator who didn't even know about Jesus yet. Three weeks later, three weeks later, the wife of this man called and said, Jim, my husband has something to say to you. He said to me, he said, Jim, Three nights ago, I was laying in my bed looking at the walls, at the shadows on the walls. I couldn't sleep. He said, I realized that if God could create this world in seven days, how hard would it be for Him to raise someone from the dead to be the Savior? And he says, I trust that Jesus is my Savior now. And I said, Amen and Amen. Jesus is your Lord. We went to see Him a week later and He said this. He says, Jim, I know that Jesus is my Savior, but my brother doesn't know Jesus as his Savior. 
I want you to talk to my brother to see if he will accept Jesus because I don't want to go to heaven if my brother is not going to be there. I said, well, you're already on your way. And I said, we will work on your brother. So the brother is still in rebellion until this day, but he's heard the message and we'll see what happens with him because he's never admitted that he's a sinner. He's never admitted that there is a God. He doesn't even believe there is a God because he believes in evolution and we just all oozed out of something to become, uh, to become what we are. So we're still working on him. But for him, we've got to go back and do the whole thing, the whole three steps. But with this last one, all we had to do was jump like with the other four to the end step and let God handle it and God handle it. So... If you have a relative that's saying, I'm too bad, let me recapitulate. I want to go back and do this for you again. If you have a relative that is so, says, I am so bad that God will not allow me to be saved and let me into heaven, you say, let me tell you something. First of all, what you've just said to me is you've admitted to me and confessed before me and God and everybody that you're a sinner. I don't want to know what your sins are. you got a pile of them and so do I. He's all, you've also admitted that there is a God and that God is the one who is the one who saves you. You're almost home, folks. You're almost home. All you have to do now is say, I want to pray for you and I want you to ask Jesus. You're my friend. I want you. You're my relative. You're my brother. You're my sister. I want you to be in heaven with me for all eternity. And, and that's where I want you to be. I'm going to pray for you and after I'm through praying for you, I want to ask you, I want you to pray that Jesus will come into your life and be your Lord. Lord Jesus, my friend here, my relative, my sister, my brother, uh, they've admitted to you, they've admitted to me that they're a sinner. And they've also admitted that only you can save them. Only you. And I want them to just ask you right now to say, Lord, come into my life and become my Savior. And say, okay, ask the Lord to be your Savior. You've done all the rest. Just ask Him to be your Savior and just wait. And they're going to say something like, Lord, will you be my Savior? And then you say, Amen. And say, listen, He has become your Savior. That's all it is. That's all it is. They say it's too simple. Say, no, it's not simple. Everything Jesus did so that He could be your Savior, He did. He came to this world. He ministered to this world. He died on a cross. He rose from the grave. He sits at the right hand of God the Father. And He did that so that you can be saved.